tetanus, often called lockjaw, is a serious condition that can be fatal if not treated properly. But do you know what causes tetanus and how it can be prevented? Think about it for a moment and feel free to share your thoughts in the comments before we dive into the details. Tetanus was derived from a Greek word, tetanos, which means stretch. It is common in many developing countries, with the highest being in unvaccinated children and children born from unvaccinated mothers. It is responsible for about 14% of neonatal deaths. It occurs worldwide, but more common in hot, damp climate with storage in organic matter. Neonatal tetanus is defined as a disease of the neonate which affects the nervous system caused by Clostridium tetani and is characterized by generalized body rigidity. The incubation period for neonatal tetanus is between 3 to 21 days with an average of 8 days. The port of entry is through the umbilical stump and the factors contributing to infections include the following. There is lack of maternal vaccination, anaerobic conditions of the umbilical stump. There is also contamination of the stump by application of non-sterile clay harboring the bacteria. Let us look at the characteristics of Clostridium tetani. So this is a gram-positive, non-encapsulated, mortal, and obligatively an aerobic bacillus. It exists in vegetative and sporulated forms. Its spores are highly resistant to disinfectants and a number of antibiotics. It is found in soil and intestines as well as feces of horses, sheep, cattle, dogs, rats, and manure-treated soil containing large numbers of spores. Let's discuss the pathophysiology. So, tetanus occurs after spores of vegetative bacteria gain access to tissues and produce toxins locally. The usual mode of entry is through a puncture wound. It could also be after an elective surgery. It can also be through burns or after an abortion. In neonates, Tetanus usually follows infection of the umbilical stump. In the presence of anaerobic conditions, spores start to germinate. Spores transform into rod-shaped bacteria and produces a potent neurotoxin called tetanospasmin and tetanolysin which potentiates infections. The toxin is inactive inside the bacteria, but when it dies, the toxin becomes activated. The toxin disseminates through the bloodstream and lymphatic system. However, it does not enter the central nervous system through this route as it cannot cross the brain barrier except at the fourth ventricle. It is taken up by the neuromuscular junction. The toxin cleaves membrane protein, which is involved in neuroexocytosis and in turn blocks neurotransmission. The toxin acts after the incubation period of 3 to 14 days 
at several sites within the central nervous system, including motor end plate, spinal cord, and brain. The toxin interferes with release of neurotransmitter and blocking inhibitor impulses. This leads to loss of reflex control responses to afferent sensory stimuli. General muscle rigidity arises from an inhibited afferent stimuli. Let's now discuss the signs and symptoms. So there is severe muscular spasms, which usually starts from the jaw, causing difficulties in opening the mouth, which is referred to as a trismus or locked jaw. There is also irritability with a high-pitched cry. There is difficulties in feeding due to spasms of the muscles of the jaw. Then the child appears to have a devilish smile due to spasms of the muscles of the face. So this is referred to as a risus sardonicus. There is hyperextension of the back with head retraction, which is referred to as obistotonus. There is also convulsion, which are usually triggered by a stimulus such as touch, light, or moving object. There is also photophobia. There is respiratory imbalance due to spasms of the muscles involved in respirations. There is also local signs of umbilical infection as well as a fever. So from these two diagrams, which one is Risus sardonicus and which one is Opistotonus? In the comment section, let me know which one is which. Okay, let's now move on to the management. Diagnosis is mainly from the clinical presentation of tetanus symptoms. The bacteria can be recovered from the wound in only 30% of cases and can be isolated even in patients who do not have tetanus. Treatment, especially for mild cases, we give anti-tetanus immunoglobulin 250 international units as a start dose. We give through IM to neutralize the toxins so that there is less harm done to the motor neurons. And convulsants such as a valium or chlorpromazine uh, can also be given. So for valium you give 2 mg per kg body weight and for chlorpromazine you give 1 to 2 mg per kg body weight. So we are giving these anticonvulsants until the convulsions and the spasms are controlled. Metronidazole is also given for 10 days through IV. Tetanus vaccination is done. Then for severe cases, what happens is that you need to admit the patient to the intensive care. Diazepam is given as a continuous IV infusion. Magnesium as well is given as a continuous IV infusion to prevent muscle spasms. Then there is removal of tetanospasmine by debliding the wound. In cases of respiratory imbalance, artificial ventilation can be injected. Antibiotics may also be given, such as uh, benzoyl penicillin, 5,000 international units, uh, four times daily, or you can give erythromycin, uh, 125 milligrams, four times daily. Let us now discuss the nursing management. So when you're looking at the nursing management, the first thing that should be I should come to your mind easy 
the aims. So when it comes to the aims, you need to make sure that you write the aims that are specific to the condition. In this case, this is the tetanus. So in the comment section, just let me know what the lesson aims could be for this condition. Okay, let's now look at the environment under the same nursing management. So you should nest the child in a quiet environment to minimize stimulation, which can lead to convulsions. The room should be semi-darkened to prevent photophobia. Maintain a clean environment to prevent nosocomial infection, and it should also be a free dust environment because dust can harbor microorganisms and cause irritations to the respiratory passage. The child should be nest in an incubator or a crib to prevent falls. Oxygen therapy equipment should be at hand in case the child experiences respiratory failure. Sanctioning apparatus should also be ready in order to ensure that the airway is kept patent and free of secretions. Under observations, you need to observe the general condition of the child in order to determine whether the child is responding to medical care or not. Vital signs are taken to monitor onset of complications and detect further deviations. Observe the child's tolerance of light in order to detect presence of photophobia. Also, you need to observe the feeding pattern of the child. Also, observe the frequency of convulsions, noting the time, its duration, and when it stops. Record on the feeds chart. Observe for cyanosis, dyspnea, and respiratory distress. Okay. So when you're done observing, you can also look at rest. So you need to minimize interference as you carry out the nursing care. Plan the care around times when treatment is given to avoid frequent handling of the child. Also, be with the child at all times in case of convulsion so that an emergency care is initiated. So, under nutrition, if the child is unable to feed by mouth due to lockjaw, an NG tube will be inserted and express breast milk will be given. As the condition improves, oral feeding will be initiated. So 5% dextrose is also given parenterally. Under hygiene, make sure that you do daily eye swabbing with normal saline to prevent eye damage. You can also do cold care, especially newborn, to minimize or prevent infections. Oral care can also be done when necessary to clean and prevent oral sepsis as the mouth may be open due to contraction uh, of the muscles of the face. You should also offer psychological care. So make sure that you educate the parents on the condition in order to allay anxiety and gain their cooperation. Keep on reassuring them and allow the mother to stay at the bedside and involve her in child care. Let us now discuss the complications. So one of the complications is respiratory failure, which is secondary to muscle spasms, obstructions by secretions, exhaustion, and pulmonary aspiration. There is also cardiac complications, which are due to hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system with a heart rate of over 180 beats per minute. There is also asphyxia. Asphyxia can be as a result of um, muscle spasms and rigidity. It could also be as a result of respiratory muscle paralysis. It could also result from um, prolonged hypoxia as well as inadequate 
oxygen delivery. Another complication is brain damage. So brain damage can be as a, uh, as a result of um, severe seizures. Okay. These seizures which are found in uh, tetanus, when they are severe, that leads to oxygen deprivation. When there is that, there is going to be stress on the brain, which potentially uh, leads to permanent brain damage. Prevention of neonatal tetanus involves several strategies aimed at reducing the risk of infection in newborns. One of the strategies is maternal immunization. Okay? So, tetanus toxoid vaccine is administered to pregnant women to provide passive immunity to the newborn. Ideally, two doses should be given, with the first dose during the first antenatal visit and the second dose at least four weeks later. A booster dose is also given so you need to ensure that women of childbearing age receive booster doses every 10 years to maintain immunity the second strategy is clean delivery practices so you need to ensure that deliveries are conducted in a clean environment either at a health facility or under hygienic conditions if at home. Use sterile instrument, instruments and supplies for cutting the umbilical cord. The third strategy is clean cord care. So you should avoid using unclean substances such as soil, cow dung, or unsterilized tools on the umbilical cord. Promote dry coat care or the use of antiseptic solutions like um, chlorhexidine for coat care in settings with high infection risk. The fourth strategy is health education. So you need to educate the mothers, families, and communities on the importance of vaccination, clean delivery, and court care. Also ensure skilled attendance at birth and discourage harmful traditional practices. The last strategy that we can, we're going to discuss is improving access to health care. So you need to strengthen antenatal care services to ensure all pregnant women have access to tetanus, toxoid vaccination, and safe delivery practices. Also, increase community awareness and involvement in your NATO programs. So this is what I had for you. If you have any questions, leave your questions in the comment section. See you in the next video.